Greetings, I'm David Kang, the founder and principal of BEI Advisors. We are a nonprofit organization based in Arizona. Our mission is to empower personal success. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Stuart Greif. He is the Executive Vice President, Chief Strategy, Innovation, and Operating Officer at Forbes Travel Guide. Welcome, Stuart. Great. Thank you, David. Thrilled to be here and congratulations on all the incredible success at DEI Advisors. I love the program and follow the podcast religiously. Thank you. I appreciate those kind words. Stuart, let's start with your career journey. What are some of the pivotal moments that changed your career trajectory and what are some of the factors that contributed to your success? Yeah. When I look back, it's really some of the bigger decisions where you're taking calculated risk, where it was about switching gears or taking on a new role and challenge in ways that at times were, you know, scary or anxiety producing or saying, Ooh, if this doesn't work out, what do I do? And I, I think Amazon, the, the tech company has a, a great um, way of thinking about things. The notion of some decisions in life are one way doors. They're irrevocable, right? You have a child you have a family, but many of them are two-way doors that are easily reversible. But in our minds, we constrain ourselves thinking that if I do try something and it doesn't work out after six months, it's not the end of the world. You can look at different pivots or have different options. And I think the critical success factors to me, I think a lot of it, it's this balance of constant, especially this generation growing up and into the future of constant learning of finding challenge, you, you build muscle through resistance, right? We build experience in life. And I have friends that stayed in the same role at the same company and everything went well, say over a decade, but they really weren't being challenged or learning or advancing or growing professionally, right? They weren't challenged where they had to have difficult conversations or um, where they had to learn and adapt to new changes in the market. And so I think there's a point we all know internally when we've been there, done that enough and something becomes easier and there's nothing wrong. You might have trade-offs in the personal life or other factors, why that makes sense, income, paying down student loans, et cetera. But over time, what you don't want to do is be in a place where you're just doing the same thing without growing because over the arc of your career, and somebody else said this, the same way money compounds when you invest early and over time, that kind of builds. Wealth, the same thing is true in how you invest in yourself. And so for me, it was seeking a lot of different roles initially in consulting. It was doing a lot of different jobs when I worked for a more traditional company after business school. And then certainly in the travel industry, it's been doing everything from startups, one that became a unicorn, to being Microsoft's global exec in travel and hospitality, along with a couple other folks to this wonderful uh, opportunity I had with Forbes Travel Guide, where I continue to do a lot of different things that constantly stretch and challenge me. The, the trick is not to do something that tears. You don't want to take, I know some people talk about YOLO, you only live once. You don't want to be reckless, right? It's the calculated in the words you talked about, calculated risks that make sense. That is so wonderful to hear. And, and I've heard other leaders talk about the influence of taking calculated risks. And, and as you mentioned, uh, many decisions are two ways. You, you can always pivot and do something different. It, it's not going to kill you. Yeah. And I also like the lesson about continuous learning and continuously reinventing yourself mm -hmm. so you're not stuck in a status quo. Those are really good lessons. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. We all faced many challenges in our careers. And I was wondering if you can share your general approach to challenges. Yeah, I think the way I think about it, my wife and I teach our kids, nobody learns to ride a bicycle the first time without falling off and scraping your knee and, and injuring yourself. So I think this uh, a reframing, oftentimes we think about challenges or constraints or, or things in ways where it throws us for a loop. As opposed to embracing, that's the very nature of work, life, right? There are going to be things that are unfair. There are going to be things that don't go your way. There's going to be unexpected surprises. Look at COVID for our industry. You can't plan for everything. So I think the first thing is having an open mind, being able to embrace and understand, and it's okay to have that be challenging, right? But the question is, so what and now what? What is it I can control and do? How can I collaborate with others? It's also, I think, natural in human nature 
that can create a withdrawn or fear or sometimes lashing out because it doesn't feel good inside in ways that we might project that on others that holds us back. So I think there's a little bit of the mastery of yourself internally of how do you look at challenges as opportunities? How do you take the, we talk about challenge an idea, not the person, right? And oftentimes it, and I think we'll get to this in, in the conversation a little later when it comes to diversity, our natural set is to have things that are comfortable, to affiliate with people that remind us of ourselves as a default and to have kind of this grouping of us and others and change is bad. And that's in our DNA so that every time there was a threat outside, we didn't die as animals, right? As human beings. And over time you learn, hey, that tree isn't going to kill me. I don't have to worry about that as a threat. So I really think a lot of it is the internal mindset and mastery, people talk about growth mindsets, how can you be constructive? I'm also still, as a senior executive, guilty at times, and it's something I've cultivated and worked over my career to be able to step back and say, it's okay to have that reaction or even to vent, but so what and now, what are you going to do about it? Because nobody owes you anything in this world, right? And people want to work, we want to work, right, David, when you led at Best Western, you did an exceptional job. People want to work with people they like people that inspire them, people that try to help find solutions. And as a leader, it's also our roles to help bring people along, to not just look at them negatively because they have an innately human uh, reaction, but it help whether it's change or challenges or development in their careers to find constructive ways to support and advance them in everybody's best interest. So true. Thanks for sharing that thought. Yeah. Uh, you're absolutely right. You mentioned uh, diversity. You are known in the industry as a very powerful advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you've also been recognized as a, a strong ally for women. Tell me, how do you think the industry can improve on these efforts? I, I think the if it's okay, if I could just step out back a little bit for just some macro thoughts that apply to not just women, but people that are diverse and my role and all of our roles, all of your listeners who are listening, whether you're a person who looks like me or somebody who has a diverse background, I, I think if I were to ask just from a pure business standpoint, and we are in business, if I had something you could do today that you could control in your business, and it is uh, going to result quantitatively based on data, Harvard Business Review has data, more revenue, more profitability, lower costs, greater employee morale, happier customers, and greater satisfaction of all stakeholders involved in your business. As a CEO, as an executive, all the way down to an analyst or entry level position, nobody in this world would say no, right? It, it, and, and I think some of it may be a bit of this reframing that diverse teams just simply perform better, right? They bring different thoughts, different ideas. They understand different elements of the customer supplier base employees. They have a variety of experiences and tools to solve problems in different contexts where somebody that may not be able to help solve in one is the one person who has the experiential basis to do it. And as a leader, you need to be able to cultivate and enable and catalyze that and channel it in a constructive way. So I think it, all of us are in business. If you're not putting diversity first as a core value, you are doing a disservice to your business, to your shareholders, to your employees, to your customers. The second thing I'll say, and I think I've got three hot takes on it, if you will, and then I'm happy to dig in, is even from the business perspective, when you think about opportunity, there, there's somebody famously said, and I believe it was a woman, it, it's a quote that's been around for a while, so it's not mine, but talent is equally distributed. Opportunity is not. Right. So talent is everywhere. But by merit of me being, let's say, born in the United States versus in a small village in an area that's a developing country, I have opportunities that others don't. The same is true. And if we're intellectually honest, recognizing that and then looking to our organizations, there is so much untapped talent potential that is not being levered. And the third thing I said, it harkens a little bit to what I talked about, what's in our human nature. We affiliate with people we're comfortable with that remind us of us naturally. And the more we get broader experiences in our life, I happen to live overseas in a country in Asia and 
had the opportunity to do that on a scholarship that brought in not just when it came to diversity of people from that region, but how my mind looked at life. Common human experiences could be manifest differently. The more experiences, the more exposure diversify us. But because historically business culture has been led and run, I'll say in the US, this is gonna vary by country and around the world, by people that look like me in terms of gender, in terms of ethnicity and color, by default, we bias even people that are well-intentioned, even myself today, as much as I appreciate all of that, those kind words, they mean something to me because others feel they have an impact to recognize me, not for my ego or because it's important. It's even more incumbent on those of us who reflect what has been the historical or legacy or existing kind of power structure to recognize a lot of that is in ways that indirectly we're self-reinforcing. And in doing so, we're cutting against the first thing I said, what's best for our business. And just from a moral, ethical, and recognizing that there is talent that we are turning our backs on, uh, which relates, frankly, to the performance, it's incumbent upon us. And I think it has to be a kind of core value that uh, people get around. And the people that get it are the people you want to connect to help make change happen. Um, it starts with each of us individually. And then from there, finding others who understand that and creating that culture. I love everything that you said. All three points are very well made, and especially like reframing the conversation. DEI and allyship are good for business. It's actually mm -hmm. a business imperative. I love that. Now, staying on the topic of diversity, diversity, of course, is more than mere representation. But harnessing the true power of diversity is really complex and difficult, mm -hmm. requires a lot of time and effort. How can we better cultivate an inclusive culture? Yeah, I think, first of all, I would say I'm not the end-all be-all, the expert. So I'll share some additional thoughts. I, I love all your interviews that you've had with so many people. And it's this in aggregate, everybody's great advice experience on that. So I'll add a couple of things, I think, to the conversation. It, Obviously, the more senior you are, the more you can inculcate that into your culture, the, the greater your span of responsibility and ability to put that in motion. And it's in words, but more importantly, it's in action. Allyship and advocacy means doing things and oftentimes things that may cause frictions or be challenging. For example, I as an individual, we have an upcoming event. I have a panel and we also have this kind of future-oriented installations. I have more than 50% of that represented by people of diverse backgrounds in terms of speakers and those presenting. Many are women as well. And in doing that, I'm making a statement, but there were a couple gaps where I didn't have a person in mind that I knew directly. And I used my network to find someone that I felt rounded out. There are a couple people that look and sound like me and have my background, right? How can I pull in other people? And oftentimes you hear there's only so many people and the same people get asked to speak. If you go a tier down, there are people of all backgrounds, regardless gender, uh, race, cultural context, BLGIQ. There are so many different uh, elements of that. You need to challenge yourself to go a little further, to use your network, to ask for somebody that, hey, has a little bit different take or background. And so, again, going to the first couple points of the business imperative, the moral ethical imperative, and this talent pool, by doing that, we're also helping create that next generation to have those voices heard, to give them the experience to develop them. And I, I think it's also speaking when people aren't in the room. I've talked about this in other times. It's oftentimes women or people of color may not be in the room. In hospitality, I think we're fortunate, the BLGT community is more represented maybe in travel. I don't want to say overrepresented or strongly because there are significant barriers depending what country and everywhere else. So I think the, the degree to which I think we've made significant progress with women, but have longer to go with women and with people of different backgrounds, including gender, sexual orientation, neurodiversity, which I'm happy to see coming on. So it, it, it is the thing when somebody's not in the room, especially if you look like me to advocate. If you are a person of a diverse background, it's trying to find the people like me, the, the coaches, build yourself your own personal 
kind of board of directors and do it based on your personal interests, right? Networking, it's a, I, I used to hate networking and I still do for its own sake. There'd be no reason for me to go up to you, David, at an event and say, hi, I'm Stuart. It might be nice if I, if I appreciated your keynote, but the question is, what are things that are you're passionate about or you're leading that I might have an interest or expertise to ask, to get your feedback, or simply saying, how's the event for you? What's of interest? And there might be touch points. So do it based on the things that you're passionate about. And that's going to lead naturally to conversations. Not every conversation will be a connection. But I think it, it starts with each and every one of us and the responsibility, and it's got to be action-oriented. And, and real quick, I'll just share this. For me, one of, one of the things was reaching out to the, the head of a major hospitality conference when there was a panel posted on LinkedIn, and it was all a bunch of white men. And it, it was approaching it not in a way it'd be easy to be like, hey, what, what are you thinking? Or in a way that could be contentious, confrontational, instead of recognizing, look, I know it's challenging. I know there are things. I'd love to hear about it. It stands out to me because, right, in this conference, this is your leadership panel. There's no women. There are no people of color. And maybe in that one battle, it was already baked into the event. But I have no doubt that person in that event has good intention. So I got to create a friendly conversation instead of pissing someone off, part of my language, right? And, and, and hopefully him and his team as they go forward, calling it out in a way where I'm also somebody senior. And I think finding constructive ways to ask the question or raise it, if you paint somebody in a corner or yourself, it leaves where to go. And it shouldn't be a cop out to not do these things, but that's uncomfortable, right? It, it's a hard conversation to say, here's a person I know, I'm taking a risk. But you have to be willing to take the risk. You have to be willing to stand up. You have to be willing to be an ally and an advocate, um, whether that's around compensation, promotions, when women and diverse members aren't in the room, even if it's not in your organization, but you're part of that conversation with your CFO or other team leaders or other executives. And so by doing that, I think you start cultivating a culture and getting other allies together to raise a voice collectively where maybe your concern, just your voice alone may not be enough. Thanks for sharing those stories and thoughts. I appreciate your speaking up at that conference to the conference organizer. It's not the most comfortable thing to do, but it's something that needed to be done. And I'm sure you did it very respectfully and I'm sure the organizers listened. Now, switching gears, let's talk about uh, your role as a strategic advisor for several companies. What is your general approach to being a strategic advisor? Yeah, I think it's, there, there are a few things that I think are really critical. One is listening. It, it's the same thing with mentoring is the solutions or what a given company or individual needs it is potentially very different from what you may presume on the outside. I had a great CEO I worked for many years ago who talked about the, the best leaders and CEOs, and, and David, you do this exceptionally well, this entire interview, I want to ask you the same questions each and every time. We're going to have to do a DEI advisor where we get to ask all of you all the questions, but people have a high question to statement ratio, right? The, the leaders are trying to understand. So I think understanding what they need. The second thing is just because you pattern recognize something in the past, the question is, What's your expertise that's going to add value? So I've been approached about being a mentor or strategic advisor or board member a number of times by folks. And I said, tell me what you're looking for. I also asked, who else do you already have around you? You don't need three people that are experts in AI or supply chain or revenue management or the same area. And, and oftentimes I've said, look, it could even be speaking at an event. I, I would love to, but I actually think this person who I know would be a much better fit. Like I have no interest. We, we're all far too busy in simply like being an advisor in name or being a mentor just to say you're doing it. Is It really is that listening and understanding the base of what they need, ensuring your kind of background fits and that you're a cultural fit, whether that's a company or a personality, and then being able to understand the larger context to make sure you're adding value. That's wonderful. I like the listening part and asking thoughtful questions to gauge the need and see if you are the right fit, whether it's from a cultural or experience standpoint and whether you can actually contribute to their success. It's a very good advice. 
I ask you this question because it is akin to mentoring, uh, understanding yeah. the uh, the person that you want to mentor. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, thinking back, you've been strategic advisor for quite a few years. What's the best advice that you have given? Yeah, I don't know. I think the best advice is always specific to that context and person. So it varied. The best advice that I gave the given company or or my mentee, I'm a, a mentor with uh, Women in Travel CIC, which I, I love. I'm obviously a mentor internally and then in the industry. And then I also am a strong advocate for hotelier, female founders in hospitality, et cetera. So I think the best advice is always going to be specific. I also think it's important to recognize and, and make sure that the person you're sharing it with and said, look, oftentimes I'll connect people in the industry. I say, this is, you know, about the opportunity, not the expectation obligation. It's not about me. And so whether it's a founder, whether it's um, an executive, whether it's a mentee is I'm sharing this. I'm one person. This is my point of view. They're like, you, nobody knows better than you what's right for you. Nobody knows better about your business, what's right for your business, and not just our conversation collectively. So I will not be offended, nor should you feel afraid to push back, to question, or disregard it. And you don't have to apologize or explain yourself to me. It's, it needs to be given and shared from the perspective of, this is me opening up to, to share what I do and what I think but not that kind of onerous expectation of doing it. And that requires a level of trust and openness and communication that I think is easier to set up when you begin, because when people know that, and as long as you follow through and are true to that, I think that's true. I think there's some broader advice that I think I've got and that I think is broadly applicable that I'd, I'd, I'd share too, which is when I was at Microsoft, Satya would say, be a learn it all, not a know it all. Right. And, and be a learn it all, not a know it all. And that gets to that curiosity, that high question ratio. Oftentimes we come in and we think where people come from inside, outside, and they join a new company. It's like, oh, everybody here seems to be an idiot, right? Like only they're coming to save the day or a new, it's like, no, until you understand what people's backgrounds and then help figure out how to merge and partner your expertise to help lead and, and evolve, you're flying blind. So I think that be a learn it all also means a lot of the people that I know that are very successful, and I, I'm not saying that you have to be senior, I just mean in terms of finding great fulfillment and satisfaction of adding value, of feeling like they're having an impact. It's not about title or level be any point in your career is they read ver voraciously. And it doesn't mean you have to read war and peace. And so, although that's fine, because that helps too. some of the best strategies that I've challenged myself to think about were from reading about evolution and nature and different ways that animals and plants um, compete and evolve. But I think really being able to do that, especially in this day and age, I think many people's careers are going to evolve much more quickly with technology, with shifts in the market. And so being able to read, understand, adapt, it also gives you the ability then to have information to connect with a broader view of people. And that, that's also experience, not just reading. Be learn it all means exploring other cultures, other parts of the world, thinking diversely in every sense of the word, not just as human beings, but in, in how problems are approached, um, how different countries and cultures approach them and being adaptive. I love that, especially <laughs> love the uh, learn it all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that goes back to the continuous learning that we talked about mm -hmm. earlier, so important to our, to our success. Now let's switch gears and talk about persuasion skills, whether we're advocating for ourselves or we're trying to get alignment when there are such diverse opinions, persuasion skills is very important. Now, how do you hone your persuasion skills and what tips can you provide us? Yeah, I think earlier in my career, it was running full speed into brick walls and not realizing it without a helmet. And, and I think over time, it's natural, like I said, for us to have our own view. We might be in a part of the organization where we're so deep in an area, but we may not see the full picture. And so that's where kind of understanding, I think, what are the priorities for the company, for different departments, for groups? Where are their incentives aligned in terms of what helps motivate them that would make them do it? Um, for some people, it's a combination of emotional appeal, data-driven, right? There might be some people where it's show me the data and other people will be like, tell me how this is impacting in, in ways that are more qualitative. And so I think 
over time, you again, this is like mastery of yourself and your own emotional state. You got to take that deep breath and say, I know it's important, but I don't know how it relates. Let me understand. Let me understand how I can turn this not in the way I describe it for myself that I think is persuasive, but if I'm sitting in the chair of the CFO or the person in marketing or the client or one of my suppliers. And by, by being able to do that from a well-rounded position to understand what's in it for them. When, when I led J.D. Power's Global Travel and Hospitality Group, we had almost no presence in the industry. I had very little budget in order to do that. We were big in other industries. I went on uh, to turn and grow that business as well as nine industry groups. I led strategy, biz dev, M&A for the company and helped double the valuation. But a critical piece was saying, look, we used to say, oh, satisfaction was here and it went there. And you're like, those are just numbers. But one of the things I did was said, what's the story? How does this connect to the industry? And with media, it's going to be different for the Wall Street Journal than CNBC. I used to appear on Squawk on the Street back then for NPR, then for USA Today. So being able to understand even at that level, from a marketing perspective, the different values and readership and what they would, and then adjusting the approach and message. And the same thing is true. I approached Cornell, with tremendous amount of respect for them. And I knew we had data that was valuable and was able to work out an, an opportunity to share our data in return because you had a hundred thousand, not only Cornell grads, but people that followed the publication. So where are the people that you're trying to reach in that case, hotel, News Network or News Now, which was an STR company, or is also I took products and things that we developed and was able to be a guest columnist and share some unique proprietary insights. So I think how you're persuasive, it has to adapt. You have to understand the incentives and bring people along and find other people that get it and are willing to help advocate and partner with you in making the case. Ultimately, if there's not a financial ROI, you're probably going to hit it up or a business ROI, or if it's not hitting a, a priority for the company's goals and objectives, it's probably going to be harder. It doesn't mean you can't achieve it, but you need to understand that as a frame and alignment and figure out a way to align to those needs, to align incentives, to make that happen. Such great advice. I've always been a fan of the seven habits of highly effective people. And one yeah. of them is seek first to understand, then to be understood. Mm -hmm. And it's so important because people are wired differently <laughs> and we have different ways of thinking about things. And it's really important to first seek well, to understand where they're coming from and what's David, important to them. DEI Advisors has grown, it's blossomed. I'd love your tips on persuasion and how you get people involved and any advice that you have. I'm, I'm sure folks will be much more interested in your depth of expertise. And would you, would you mind sharing a couple from your perspective? It is about uh, trying to understand where they're coming from. From my experience working at Best Western, which is a very diverse organization and many different stakeholders who think differently about the future. It is about understanding what's important to them, what they try to protect and what they want to look for in terms of gains. It's about the fear and greed, what people are afraid of, what they want to gain. And if you can and have solutions that can address all those concerns. I think it's really important to be respectful mm -hmm. and trying to understand people and respectful and giving a solution because there's no such thing as all sides fits all. Mm -hmm. it's, it's one solution that's going to upset some people. And mm -hmm. if you're respectful along the way, they're more willing to give you some leeway to try things out. Mm -hmm. um, so those that. are just uh, a few of my learnings from Best Western. I love that. Now, we are running a bit tight on time. Okay. And I was wondering if I can ask you three more questions. So first, you being a chief innovation officer, how do you foster a culture of innovation and continuous improvement in big organizations? Yeah, I think you have to find small wins, even as you're working on big stuff and break it down to milestones that people can celebrate and feel good. I think it's about uh, aligning incentives, whether it's salespeople to sell innovative new things and spiff plans, or whether it's being able to give people the time and latitude to play. Oftentimes, it may be setting up a group separate from the existing business, especially in large organizations. Um, 
you, you may know Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen, a Harvard MBA professor. He's talked about the notion that as, as a company that's exceptionally well at executing, it kind of codifies and optimizes on that business model. So to develop something new may die within. Apple started the iPhone separate from it. So I think bringing a mix of people that have not just a singularity of vision, but different backgrounds, some of which may be the legacy traditional company to help figure out how to anchor in, and it may be bringing outsiders with point solution. But I think a lot of it is also about how you lead, how you break it down, how you make success visible to communicate and celebrate and keep this kind of positive growth mindset. It might be winning on a much smaller scale than you want to longer term to earn the right for more budget and advocacy. So instead of doing the entire country or region, it might be like, how do we show this on a smaller scale as a beta internally to get the bigger funding and investment to do it that may actually be faster than if you try to do it bigger and try to get everybody all at once. So I think there are a variety of ways you can do that, but I think you have to recognize the traditional culture and business and hierarchy is aligned to the current model. So find ways to align their incentives, their interests, and find ways to be able to, as we talked about, I think in this conversation, understand people's motivations so you can continue to show progress and build a sense of momentum. That's great. I love that. And I think it's really important to continue to build that uh, momentum of success. Mm -hmm. It's important to motivate people through that. Now you're very accomplished and you've done a lot in your career. And looking back with all that you've learned and experienced, what advice would you give to your younger self? Wear sunscreen, but I think everybody says that. So that's, that might not be as helpful. I think it's, there, there are two areas. One is be willing to take risks. It's that notion of two doors on, on smaller scales, A-B test things. Again, we talk about like building muscle. I think it's, there's probably a point at which I stayed at JD Power an extra year or two. And I knew I was, and didn't have the right trade-offs. I probably should have. Um, moved on sooner. And that's nothing negative about J.D. Power or uh, any of my colleagues. I had an amazing experience there. So I think it, it's that kind of pushing yourself to take on new challenges. And when I look back, the biggest risks in my life, the bigger things are the things that give me the greatest satisfaction, whether that was taking this current role on, being at Microsoft, going to a startup, going from consulting to a traditional company and in my personal life. And I met my wife when we were 19, 20 years old and our lives went apart and 24 years later came back together. And I made choices on career, personal side, and, and I've never been happier in my life personally and same thing professionally. So I think being willing to take those risks and being able to do it in a way that's a two-way door, not reckless, but uh, calculated, as, as you said, David, those are things that I would would say are, are, are the things that I should uh, pay attention to. I totally agree with you, especially at a younger age, take even more risk because mm -hmm. they are not going to be fatal. Yeah. Our show is about self-empowerment. Wondering if you can give some parting advice on self-empowerment. Yeah, I think it's it's about Melissa Mayer, who I know is is part of DE Advisor, former CMO of uh, of Expedia, talks about for women asking for what you want. Oftentimes, we may attribute to others that we're not being seen, we're not being heard, and whether that's compensation, promotion issues, you, you have to be willing to speak up and do it in a way that's constructive. Oftentimes, it's because people are just so busy, right? We're all so busy these days where it's like, it may not even be intentional. It may just be in addition to work. We have no idea what somebody's going through personally in their life, kids, dating, right? Divorce, all sorts of things, aging parents. And it's important to be able to show, to, to say, look, this is what I've achieved this quarter and, and proactively and the impact you had. And uh, talk to me about, I would like to be in this role and work towards this career rise, can bring somebody around to your side of the table and ask them, not at the, the year end review, but throughout the year for constructive feedback in ways that validate your own, but also pierce their consciousness. So as they look for opportunities, find the people that kind of value you and what you're doing, right? That give you the opportunities to stretch and grow, even raise your hand and say, hey, I'd love to jump on. I, I realize we have a lot to do and these are my primary goals. But I hear this project, could I sit in on a meeting? Could I help out in a small way so I can learn and contribute? I think those are things, not in a, sometimes people are like, 
Oh, not in a, I'm sure in Japan, you say shining the apple, like for the teacher and other parts of the world, we say kissing somebody, kissing up. I don't mean that at all, but just genuinely, it's like, if you want to learn, you know, find ways to contribute value or do it above and beyond what you're doing. I think the other thing is networking is find the people where you have interests. I think there are points in my career where I was so focused on just doing what I was doing 24 seven. I didn't have connection that both would have improved and enhanced my performance and what I could do, as well as longer term compounded in a way that uh, I appreciate I've been recognized for it now, but it's, it, 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 it's important block time in your schedule for white space, block time in your schedule to connect with people. Um, it is an essential part of doing your job better, even though it may seem like a distraction. And then if we have time, I've got one small closing piece of advice. I'd be happy to share just a story that I think relates to it too. Yeah, sure. Let me just comment on the two things that you mentioned, networking, which is vitally important. You've got a network within and outside of your organization and being an advocate for yourself. That is so important. It's a lesson that I hadn't learned when I was coming up the ladder. It wasn't until about 20 years ago that I mm -hmm. learned the importance of being your self-advocate. If you don't advocate for yourself, who's going to do that for you? Yeah. So you got to yeah. learn to do that properly. Well, uh, there's a subtle way of doing it in such mm -hmm. a way that it doesn't come across as being boastful. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's something that we got to do for ourselves. Okay, now let's share your story. Okay, so in closing, if I could tie everything we talked together in a way that there's this story of the professor who's got one of those stadium classrooms and everyone's gathered around. They come in for class one day and he's got a, a fishbowl on top of his professor's desk in front. And he asks, is the fishbowl full? And the students say, no, it's empty. It's just got air in it. And so he goes underneath the desk and, and pulls out these big rocks, which he piles into the top and asks the students, is it full now? And they're like, yeah, it's full. And then he goes under the desk and pulls out a bucket that he pours these pebbles that start like bouncing around and filling up to the top. And it's pretty full at this point. Is it full now? And they're like, yeah, it's full now. Okay. So he goes underneath and he pulls a bucket of sand. Right now they're starting to catch on all the way filters in to the top. Is it full now? So finally they say no. So he says, good. He comes out a bucket of water and fills all the remaining space up with water. It's overflowing, pouring onto the top of the desk. Is it full now? Everyone says, yes. He agrees. He says, what's the moral of the story? And eager students raise their hand. And he says, yes. And one student says, no matter how busy or full your life is, there, there's always really room for more. And he said, is that right? And everybody nodded and they agreed. Yeah, that was the moral of the lesson when he showed. He said, no, the moral is if you don't put the big stuff in first, you'll never fit it in later. So in your career and your personal life and everything you're doing, what are the big things that are most important? And making sure that you keep, right, focus on that prioritization and that strategy. And then you can do the little things, the pebbles around it. And if there's still more time and bandwidth without sacrificing it, but if you try to do everything or you, you're, you're never going to get anywhere and you're not going to get the big things in. So that's just my parting advice in life personally, as well as professionally. I love that. You kind of fit the big things in first. I absolutely love that. What a great way to end the interview. Thank you very much. Stuart Greif, uh, thank you for being our guest. And to the audience, if you enjoyed this interview, I hope you will join us on our website, deiadvisors.org. We hope to see you there. Thanks again, Stuart. Thank you, David.